Welcome to Crime, Corruption, and Cocktails, the true crime podcast where we look at cases of corruption and negligence and examine their historical and cultural implications. Today, I'm drinking a hard cider. What do you have, Del? I am drinking a glass of Moscato, and on this week's episode, we are looking at the murder of Ronald Williams at the hands of his fellow officer, Antoinette Frank. Antoinette Frank applied to the New Orleans Police Department, the NOPD, in early 1993. According to author Chuck Hutzmeyer, Frank was caught lying on several sections of her employment application and failed to standard psychiatric evaluations with psychiatrist Philip Stakura advising against hiring her. Despite this, Frank got a second chance to apply. The NOPD was shorthanded at the time as officers were paid less than similarly sized cities. It was losing officers faster than they could be replaced. And the ranks had been decimated by several arrests for murder and drug activity. Many potential applicants were shut out due to a requirement that all officers be residents of New Orleans, a requirement that was only changed in 2014. NOPD officials also thought having more African Americans like Frank on the force would ease longstanding racial tensions in the majority Black city. She was hired on February 7, 1993, and graduated from the police academy on February 28. Although Frank graduated near the top of her academy class, her tenure with the NOPD was mostly undistinguished. Her fellow officers thought she was rather shy, had no idea what police work really entailed, and lacked the decisiveness to be a good officer. At times, they thought Frank reared into irrational behavior. As early as August 1993, Frank's supervisors wanted to send her back to the academy for further training. On November 25, 1994, Four, Frank handled an incident in which Rogers Lacalle, a known drug dealer, had been shot. An investigator with the Department of Public Safety and Corrections, the DOC, believed this was the first contact between the two, although in her statement, Frank claimed that they had met some eight months before the murders. Frank had taken a statement from Lacalle after he was shot on the street and initially got closer to him in hopes of turning his life around. However, she was smitten by Lacalle's quote-unquote bad boy persona, and their relationship soon turned sexual. She kept up her relationship, even though she was well aware she was jeopardizing her career. The association between Frank and Lacalle became notable after other police officers witnessed Lacalle driving her car and even observed him moving her police unit at the scene of an accident she was investigating. On one occasion, Lacalle accompanied her on a complaint call where she introduced him as a quote-unquote trainee. On other occasions, she introduced Lacalle as her nephew. Prior to the murders, others testified that Frank and Lacalle would pull over and rob motorists while in a squad car. Frank refused to discuss her relationship with Lacalle during the DLC investigation except to say that she was trying to help him. It was later revealed that the two had an ongoing sexual relationship. When asked why she would continue the relationship, knowing that Lacalle had been involved in drug dealing and a shooting, she responded that she would not disassociate herself from him just because of his past. The investigator also questioned Frank about trying to buy a 9mm ammunition for Lacalle at Walmart on the day before the Kim Ong murders, but stated that she was a police officer and that there was nothing wrong with her buying ammunition. In her statement, she claimed that she and Lacalle were not dating and had never been intimate. Frank refused to discuss anything regarding the murders. Every time the investigator asked her a question, she told him to, quote, look it up in the record, end quote, or asserted her innocence. However, during her interview with the DOC investigator, Frank claimed to have had a male suitor, but refused to go into any specifics because he worked for the police department. After midnight on March 4th, 1995, Frank and Lacaz visited Kim On, a Vietnamese restaurant run by the Vu family in New Orleans East. Frank had sometimes worked there off-duty as a security guard. 
As the employees cleaned the closed restaurant, Chow Vu went into the kitchen to count money and entered the dining room of the restaurant to pay Ronald Austin Williams II. Williams was a colleague of Frank who had been working as the security guard that night to supplement his policeman's salary. He joined the New Orleans Police Department in 1991 and was a married father of two. When Chow went to pay Williams, Chow noticed Frank approaching the restaurant. Frank and Lacaz had been at the restaurant twice earlier in the night to get leftover food to eat. When Chow had let her out on the last visit, she could not find the front door key, and with Frank returning for the third time, she sensed something was wrong. Chow ran to the kitchen to hide the money in the microwave. Frank entered the front door using the key she had stolen from the restaurant earlier and walked quickly past Williams, pushing Chow, Chow's brother Kwok, and a restaurant employee into the doorway of the restaurant's kitchen. Williams started to follow, hoping to find out what was happening when shots rang out. Lacaz had slipped behind Williams and shot him in the neck, severing his spinal cord and instantly paralyzing him. As Williams fell, Lacaz continued to shoot him in the head and back, mortally wounding him. As Frank turned back to the restaurant dining room, Chow grabbed Kwok to hide somewhere. Chow, Kwok, and the employee hid in the rear of a large walk-in cooler in the kitchen, turning out its light as they entered. They did not know the whereabouts of their other brother and sister, Ha and Choing Vu, who had been sweeping the dining room floors when Frank entered the restaurant. From inside the cooler, Chow and Kwok could partially see the restaurant's kitchen and front. Chow initially could see Frank looking for something in the kitchen. As Frank moved out of Chow's line of vision, additional gunshots were fired and then observed Frank searching where the Voos usually kept their money. Frank and Lacaz had been shouting at Ha and Choing, demanding the restaurant's money, but they did not know where Chow had hidden it. Frank pistol-whipped 17-year-old Choing when he hesitated in revealing the location of the money. Frank got the money out of the microwave, then shot 21-year-old Ha three times as she knelt, pleading for her life. Then she shot Choing six times. After Frank and Lacaz left the premises, Chow tried frantically to call 911 on her cell phone, but the cooler prevented her from getting a usable signal. Kwok emerged from the cooler and ran out of the restaurant's back door to a nearby friend's home to call 911 to report the murders. The robbers fled the restaurant, and Frank dropped the cause off at a nearby apartment complex, both knowing that witnesses were left behind. Frank heard the 911 call on her portable police radio saying that an officer was down at the Kim Ahn restaurant. She borrowed a patrol car and returned to the scene. Posing as a responding officer, she intended to kill Chow and Kwok to ensure that there would be no witnesses. Parking in the rear, Frank entered through the restaurant's back door and made her way through the kitchen to the dining room where Chow waited for help at the front door. As Chow bolted through the restaurant's front door to the safety of arriving officers, Frank immediately identified herself as a police officer. Chow told Frank she knew what she had done and cried to the officers that Frank had committed the crimes. Eddie Rance, the homicide detective who worked the case, believed Frank and Lacaz planned the robbery to get revenge on Williams. Frank believed Williams was shortchanging her on hours and pay at the Kim on and wanted revenge. Rance subsequently described Frank as the most cold-hearted person he had ever encountered in three decades as an officer. Chow and Frank were questioned in detail while seated at different tables in the restaurant. Frank was arrested and charged with three counts of first-degree murder. Lacaz was arrested and charged later that night. Frank was taken to police headquarters for additional questioning, where she later confessed to the crimes along with Lacaz. She was believed to be the first New Orleans police officer to be charged with killing a fellow officer. Frank and Lacaz were indicted by a New Orleans parish grand jury on April 28, 1995. Their trials were severed and Lacaz was tried first from July 7 to July 21st, 1995 before Judge Frank Morello. He was found guilty as charged and sentenced to death. His main tip-off had been using William Chevron credit card at a Chevron station in Gretna just minutes after the robbery and murders. Frank's trial began on September 5, 1995, also before Morella. Although Frank's attorneys had subpoenaed 39 witnesses, they didn't call a single one. On September 12, 1995, the jury needed only 22 minutes to return a guilty verdict on all counts. 
at the time, a record for a capital murder case in New Orleans. The next day, they needed only 45 minutes to recommend the death penalty. She was formally sentenced to death on October 20th, 1995, and sent to death row at Louisiana Correctional Institute for Women, the LCIW, in St. Gabriel near Baton Rouge. Officer Williams was interred in Lake Lawn Cemetery on March 7th, 1995. His name was inscribed on the memorial wall at the National Law Enforcement Officers Memorial in Washington, D.C. On October 18, 2006, Frank's lawyer argued before the Louisiana Supreme Court that her death sentence should be overturned because she was denied state-funded experts to help prepare for the sentencing phase of her trial. They argued that the defense needed to conduct, quote, an investigation into the defendant's background for possible mitigating evidence, end quote. Frank's attorneys introduced the testimony of psychiatrists who said that possible traumatic events in Frank's childhood could have affected her her behavior at the time of the murders and that she may have been suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. A psychiatrist retained by the state disagreed that Frank showed symptoms of trauma. He agreed with the diagnosis of narcissistic personality disorder with antisocial tendencies given to Frank by doctors at the Louisiana Correctional Institute for Women. On May 22, 2007, the Louisiana Supreme Court ruled 5-2 to two that the death penalty should be upheld. On July 23, 2015, retired District Judge Michael Kirby threw out Roger LaCalve's conviction and sentence and ordered a new trial. Kirby said that LaCalve deserved a new trial because one of the juries hid the fact that he was a Louisiana state trooper and previously worked as a railroad policeman. At the time, commissioned law enforcement officers were legally barred from sitting on a jury. Kirby wrote that while he felt that the evidence of LaCalle's guilt was quote-unquote overwhelming, the jurist's misconduct amounted to a quote-unquote structural defect and a quote a violation of a constitutional right so basic to a fair trial, end quote, that the only remedy was a new trial. Kirby's ruling had no effect on Frank's conviction. An appellate court later overturned a new trial order for LaCalle's. Fourth Circuit appellate judge Edwin Lombard, Paul Bonown, and Madeline Ledreau ruled, quote, after a review of the state's right application in light of the applicable laws and arguments of the parties, we find that the trial court erred in finding that the seating of Mr. Settle, that was the police officer jury person on the defendant's jury, was a structural error entitling him to a new trial, end quote. Jenny, what are your thoughts on the murder of Ronald Williams? This is a story I had not heard before, so it was really shocking to read through everything and to talk about it today. It's horrible. It's so scary and sad what happened to him. I mean, who knows if he was shorting Antoinette on hours, but you don't kill somebody because of that. And just how many other people had to die or be injured or traumatized because of her anger as well. She definitely doesn't sound like someone that should have been a police officer. And it seems like many, many red flags came up and no one really did that much about it. I mean, it seemed like she didn't really know what police work entailed So. You would think, how could someone like that even like graduate or even like last a year as a police officer? It doesn't make any sense to me. And I think her relationship with Lacaz just really escalated things that were probably already going on within her head. It seemed like maybe she was like a little bit of like a paranoid person too. We mentioned that she didn't seem to be someone that could make decisions and did make irrational decisions. And I mean, that's clearly what happened with these murders. It's horrible. What are your thoughts? I agree with you. I think that this is a situation where, and you see this in a lot of other cases, like with the Border Patrol, where 
lack of staff, a lack of qualified staff leads to really bad hiring decisions. And then you have someone like this on the police force that has all the rights, privileges, and power of a police officer. And she clearly used that to her advantage. I think that her relationship with Lacalle's was definitely an ill-fated one. And the fact that he was driving her police car, the fact that other officers had witnessed this, and even her supervisors wanted her to go back to the academy, but nothing happened. It's just a sad set of an event. Ronald definitely didn't deserve this. The views definitely didn't deserve this. And I agree with you. Just because you felt like someone was shortchanging you or taking hours that you thought belonged to you doesn't mean that you get to kill them. Like, that just makes no sense to me. And reading through a lot of the details in this case, it definitely just seems that Williams was better at the job and the views felt safer with him being there versus her. Because again, She was constantly bringing a known drug dealer, a known thief into this restaurant where a lot of it is a cash business. And Frank knew that because she had worked for them before. I think it's interesting that they were going back and forth on his trial and whether he needed a new one. I don't know if I have a strong opinion either way, but it definitely seems like they could have gone through with a new trial, excluding jurors that shouldn't have been there and came out with the same conclusion. I definitely understand, you know, looking at it like, well, the evidence is strong enough. Why go through a new trial? But at the same time, you want to make sure that everything is fair and, you know, kind of called down the middle when it comes to taking away someone's freedom and ultimately um, their life. Though it's It's been some back and forth on whether the death penalty is going to be used in either one of these cases. Like many states, Louisiana doesn't put many women to death. And so the question is, is Frank going to be put to death? We don't know that, but we'll definitely keep you guys updated as this case progresses. One of the things that I wanted to go back to, though, was... The DLC investigation, it was definitely very detailed. And I do wonder how much of that evidence came from Lacaz, because Frank really wasn't giving them that much detail, but they had a lot of specifics of their relationship. It didn't say that it came specifically from him, but based off some of his previous actions, I really wouldn't put it past him to have turned on her, or at least offered up evidence without the security of some sort of like immunity or reduced sentence agreement with uh, prosecutors and other investigators. Yeah, I do agree. And I find all of that pretty interesting, too. I wanted to mention, too, I forgot to mention this, how when Chow had called, going back to Antoinette Frank, when Chow had called the police for help, that Frank is the one that came back. How like evil is that to you had your chance to murder her and other people in her family. And then you come back to finish the job, like pretending that you're on duty. There's just something. So I don't know, like morally corrupt about that. Yeah. And you think of the relationship that she had with this family and she still decided to do this over money. There could have been a jealousy aspect. There could have been a lot of other things at play. But at the end of the day, this was over money. And I know that she wasn't getting paid a lot. But like you said before, that is no excuse for you to go murder someone who was just trying to make extra money to take care of his family. That's why he was there. That's why he was in that restaurant that night. He was just trying to earn money to take care of his family, protect this other um, family who were working at this restaurant. They were just trying to make a better way, a better life for themselves. And you repeatedly come back. I think we said she came back something like three times, like essentially scoping out the restaurant and trying to figure out like when it would be best for her to commit this crime. 
and like try to find the money. It's really gross. She's one of the more disgusting people that we've talked about just because of the interpersonal connections that she had with her victims. One of the reasons given for Antoinette's appeal was her narcissistic personality disorder. We're going to dive deeper into what this disorder is and how it impairs those who suffer from it. Please note that this is a general discussion and any advice or diagnosis of mental health disorders should be handled by a licensed mental health professional. Narcissistic Personality Disorder, or NPD, is one of 10 personality disorders recognized in the fifth edition of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, the DSM-5. Narcissistic personality was first described by the psychoanalyst Robert Walder in 1925. The term narcissistic personality disorder was coined by Heinz Kohat in 1968. Water's initial study has been influential in the way narcissism and the clinical disorder narcissistic personality disorder are defined. And we do want to note again that there is a difference between the actual personality disorder and what we use in a colloquial or like pop culture term of calling someone a narcissist. Just because you call someone a narcissist doesn't mean that they have this disorder that shares its name. NPD is characterized by a lifelong pattern of exaggerated feelings of self-importance, an excessive need for admiration, a delusional sense of status, diminished ability or unwillingness to empathize with others' feelings, and interpersonally explorative behavior. This disorder affects anywhere between 0.5 and 5% of the general U.S. population with a greater prevalence in men than women. Narcissistic personality disorder usually develops either in youth or in early adulthood. True symptoms of MPD are pervasive, are apparent in varied social situations, and are rigidly consistent over time. Severe symptoms of NPD can significantly impair the person's mental capabilities to develop meaningful human relationships such as friendship, kinship, and marriage. Generally, the symptoms of MPD also impair the person's psychological ability to function socially, either at work or at school or within important societal settings. The DSM-5 indicates that in order to qualify as symptomatic of MPD, the person's manifested personality traits much substantially differ from social norms. People with NPD exaggerate their skills, accomplishments, and their degree of intimacy with people they consider high status. A sense of personal superiority may lead them to monopolize conversations, look down on others, or to become impatient and disdainful when other persons talk about themselves. Although there are no specific causes for NPD, it is described using the biopsychosocial model, which describes a combination of risk factors from biological, psychological, and socio-environmental factors. This includes but is not limited to genetics, neurobiology, trauma, abuse, and parenting. Treatment for NPD is primarily psychotherapeutic. There is no evidence that psychopharmacological treatment is effective for NPD, although it can be proven useful for treating comorbid disorders. The presence of NPD in patients undergoing psychotherapy for the treatment of other mental disorders is associated with slower treatment progress and higher dropout rates. In this therapy, the goals often are examining traits and behaviors that negatively affect life, identifying ways these behaviors cause stress to the person and others, exploring early experiences that contributed to narcissistic defenses, developing new coping mechanisms to replace those defenses, helping the person see themselves and others in more realistic and nuanced ways rather than wholly good or wholly bad, identifying and practicing more helpful patterns of behavior, developing interpersonal skills, and learning to consider the needs and feelings of others. Jenny, what are your thoughts on this? And also, what are your thoughts on how narcissism is another one of those things that are used in a more 
pop culture sense, but it's also a legitimate medical condition. I'm really glad you brought up the like quote unquote pop culture aspect of it all because I'm very glad people are talking about mental health more and that it seems like more people are getting some type of therapy for themselves. But I think stemming from that is a lot of therapy talk from people that either don't know what they're talking about or people that are just using it in a way to either like excuse their bad behavior or to, I don't want to say like make other people feel bad about themselves, but like we said, not everybody is a narcissist. So not everyone deserves that title. And it's really frustrating for me to see that. I mean, we said that it's what, how uh, such a small percent of people. So the actual narcissistic personality disorder is only between 0.5 to 5%. So how many of us have really like interacted and had like intimate relationships with people with narcissistic personality disorder? Not many, most likely. It obviously does exist. And you can definitely have some of these like narcissistic tendencies without having this full blown disorder. And I'm sure there are like, there's severity to the levels of having this disorder. But that is what you were saying before you even started talking. That was like the first thing that came to mind, how people just throw these things around. And it does kind of make me roll my eyes. And I feel like it waters down things. And maybe in a way, it definitely blows things out of proportion because like we said not much of the population is a true narcissist I guess you'd say but it it kind of makes it seem like less serious too I thought it was interesting to hear about like the therapy involved for it and I guess just kind of hearing that people need to learn how to consider the needs and feelings of others because I guess that is what you think of when you think of like the typical narcissist, but then to hear about how that is like treatment was kind of surprising to me. What are your thoughts? I definitely agree with you. It's one of those things where I totally understand why it happens, right? You hear this term and everyone becomes sort of like an armchair psychiatrist, right? Like, oh, okay, I have this list of symptoms and I think I can pair it with this person. And it's like, no, these lists of symptoms have been studied by experts in the field and they're applied using, first, one-on-one conversations with people. A lot of people like to diagnose individuals that they've never had conversations with. They'll look on the TV and say, oh, that's a narcissist. And it's like, well, you don't know that. It could just be a self-indulgent person. It could just be a celebrity who has all the attention on them. So of course, they're going to talk about themselves because that's what's going to get them more money, more press, you know, more admiration, which is what a lot of celebrities live for. Would we call all celebrities narcissists? No, that would be ridiculous. And I also think that in some ways it cheapens people that are actually going through this disorder. For anything to be a disorder, right? It's something that is negatively affecting someone's life. And if it's a thing where it's seen as common or seen as something that everyone else has, you could have a situation where people who actually have MPD are viewing themselves not away from the norm, not as someone that has a psychological disorder, but someone who is just like, you know, the celebrity that we're seeing on TV. And that's definitely not a good thing because we definitely want anyone that's being negatively affected by a mental health disorder to get the help that they need. And I think this is where a lot of personality disorders, where it's definitely sad to hear that there's not much in the way of like treatment. A lot of it is trying to manage the other things that come along with it. But for narcissistic personality disorder, there's definitely like keen things that people can do. And we definitely recommend that for anyone that thinks they may have something that you see a professional, you know, just don't take it from a podcast. Don't take it from a random YouTube video. Like go seek help because it could be that 
it's a season in your life that you're dealing with, or you might have something serious going on that only a professional, not yourself, not your friends, not a random person on television can really help you with. So we wanted to end this episode looking at some other female killer cops. And we're going to start with Amber Geiger. On September 6, 2018, Geiger left work at 9.33 p.m. at the end of a 13 and a half hour shift. She drove to the apartment complex, parking her vehicle in the parking garage of the fourth floor at approximately 9.46 p.m. At this time, she was speaking over the phone with her partner, who had telephoned her during her journey home, in a conversation which lasted until about 9.55 p.m. Still armed with a handgun, but no longer wearing a body cam, Geiger had walked to Bowl Jean's apartment, supposedly believing it was her own and failing to notice any signs that she was on the wrong floor, including a distinctive red doormat outside the apartment. Attempting to unlock the door, she noticed it was ajar. She entered the apartment and found Jean, who was sitting in his living room eating ice cream unarmed. Geiger fired her handgun twice at Jean, striking him in the chest. She would later testify that she believed him to be an intruder and that she feared he would kill her. Geiger telephoned 911 at 9.59 p.m. Jean was taken to a nearby hospital where he died from his wounds. The Texas Rangers investigated the shooting, which led to Geiger's arrest three days later. Geiger was initially charged with manslaughter, but was later charged with murder. The initial charge of manslaughter and the racial aspects of this shooting resulted in protests in the following days. The Dallas Police Department placed Geiger on paid administrative leave after the shooting. The department fired her on September 24th, 2018. On November 30th, 2018, Geiger was indicted on murder charges by a Dallas County grand jury. On October 1st, 2019, Geiger was found guilty of murder. The jury deliberated for six hours to reach the verdict. The jurors also considered the lesser charge of manslaughter. On October 2nd, Geiger was sentenced to 10 years in prison after the jury deliberated for an hour. Geiger is currently in prison in the Mountain View Correctional Center. She will be eligible for release as early as September 2024, although her full sentence runs until September 2029. Next, we'll look at Lori Bembenek. While training at the academy, Bembenek met and became close with another female trainee, Judy Zess. At a rock concert in May 1980, Zess was arrested for smoking marijuana. Bembenek's subsequent dismissal from the MPD on August 25th stemmed from her involvement in filing a false report on Zess's arrest. After being fired, Bembenek discovered scandalous photos of several MPD officers, including her future husband, Alfred O. Fred Schultz, dancing nude on picnic tables in Gordon Park near one of their favorite hangouts, the Trax Tavern. She took the pictures to the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, arguing that while she was fired for a minor infraction, the photos proved that other police officers committing more serious violations were not punished. The EEOC encouraged Bembenek to file a discrimination report with the MPD's Internal Affairs Division. Around that time, Bembenek met Schultz, then a 13-year-old veteran of the MPD. Schultz had two sons and had obtained a divorce from his first wife, Christine, in November 1980. Bembenek and Schultz were married in January 1981 in Waukegan, Illinois. On May 21, 1981, at approximately 2.15 a.m., Schultz's ex-wife, Christine, was murdered in her Milwaukee home. She was shot point-blank into her back through her heart by a single shot from a 38 caliber pistol. Christine was gagged and blindfolded, and her hands were tied in front of her with rope. Her two sons, then 7 and 11 years old, found her face down on her bed and bleeding. Schultz initially stated he was on duty investigating a burglary with his partner, Michael Durfee, at the time of the murder, but years later admitted they were actually drinking at a local bar. When ballistics testing allegedly revealed it was his off-duty revolver that was the murder weapon, suspicion shifted to Bembenek, as she had been alone in the apartment she shared with Schultz and had access to both the gun and a key to Christine's house that he had secretly copied from his oldest son's house key. Bembenek was arrested for Christine Schultz's murder on June 24, 1981. 
On March 9th, 1982, Bembenek was found guilty of first-degree murder and sentenced to life in prison. She was imprisoned at the Teichita Correctional Institution in Fond du Lac, Wisconsin. On November 20th, 2010, she died at a hospice facility in Portland, Oregon from liver and kidney failure. Jenny, what are your thoughts on these two cases? I definitely remember the Amber Geiger case because it was recent and because I feel like for a while you could not turn on your TV without hearing that. What a bizarre story. I don't know how you could go to the wrong apartment and think it's yours. I don't know. I mean, she probably had said she was sleep deprived. It was a 13 and a half hour shift. That's a really long time. I guess you press like the wrong elevator button and then, you know, you're so on autopilot that you don't notice. But I don't know. I find that weird. Like I've done that at a hotel, but not for my home. And then to immediately basically shoot to kill someone and not try to announce yourself like, Hey, what are you doing here? I think that brings up like a lot of questions with how policing works. I think that's, you know, a lot of questions that people have around, do you really need to be shooting people? It's just a bizarre case. I don't know how I feel necessarily about like manslaughter versus murder because I guess at first I was thinking like, well, it probably was manslaughter, but I don't know. It seemed like her point was to kill somebody if she shot a person in the chest. I mean, what are the odds that, you know, they're going to go on and live their life easily after that? Just bizarre. I didn't realize that she was going to be, I guess, eligible so soon. Um, I mean, that's next year. It's just a year away and her full sentence will run not too long from now either. For Lori Bembenek, I hadn't heard of this, and it's interesting. I mean, I think she did the right thing by going to the the EEOC to complain and then filing a complaint. It's a shame that things had to take such a, a horrible turn. And what was really the point of her killing this woman? It, I, we didn't talk about like the ins and outs of the relationship, but what the hell? Like, it seems kind of unprovoked. It seems like there's no point in this. And then to kill someone, like we said, point blank, so cruelly, and then to leave them for their children to find, that's evil, for sure. What are your thoughts on these, Del? I mean, I think something that ties Lori, Amber, and Antoinette all together is that it is a clear indictment on how trigger-happy cops can be. Uh, whether they're male or female, to be honest with you. And I agree. They all exhibited just a level of callous that you would hope no one has, but definitely people that carry around guns for a living, you would hope that they wouldn't have. When it comes specifically for Amber Geiger, yes, I remember this case, too, because of just wall-to-wall coverage of this. I remember just hearing her story for the first time and just thinking, no, just no. There's no way you just walk into the wrong apartment. Because what happens if the door is locked? Like, do you break down the door? Do you call the cops? Do you start shooting at the doorknob? Like, what was your mindset? And my key is not working, but the door is open. So I'm going to open it. See a man sitting, eating ice cream, just relaxing. And I'm just going to let off a couple shots. That doesn't scream manslaughter for me. Like, that screams that you have such an indifference to life that murder is the only charge for you. I definitely think the 10 years was not enough. It's definitely sad that she may end up serving around about five-ish years for taking a human life, which is just not enough time. When it comes to Lori, this... When I was reading over the details of this case, it just read like a weird novel where you're just like, I don't even know how all these things are connecting with each other, but 
I feel sad that it ended up with a mom of two dying at the hands of her ex-husband's current wife, who, for whatever reason, decided that that's what she needed to do. When I was reading this case, honestly, it reminded me a lot of Betty Broderick. Just the sense of killing a lover of the person. But it was even stranger because you were with the guy. And the fact that I agree with you, okay, yes, you see police officers doing something wrong, definitely report them. I definitely agree with that. But it's weird that she found those scandalous pictures, but married the person afterwards. So were you really upset at the pictures or were you just using this as a way to get your job back? Like, I don't know. This is definitely, it's an older case. She's already passed away. I do wish that we knew more information on what Fred ended up doing afterwards. Because you have a situation where not only did you lose your wife, because now she's in jail, but he's now also raising two kids without a mom. So I do wish we had a bit more information on him. And just the what the Milwaukee Police Department ended up doing because it just seems like a whole lot of corruption and shenanigans were going on in that department. And this case just brought that to the forefront. I definitely agree with the the trigger happy argument. And I'm glad people are talking about it in this country because I don't think it's right not to get into like personal thoughts and feelings on the police, but there's no need to be shooting all of these people especially like someone doing something so mundane. Let's say that Jean was someone that broke into her apartment and was, she did just find him eating ice cream. I mean, yes, like you're going to be worried and being like, what is going on? But does that constitute someone being shot and killed? I mean, again, let's say that he was just like a random person in her actual apartment could this person be going through like a mental health crisis? They don't need to be shot. It's, it just doesn't make any sense to me. And yeah, I, with the Lori Bembenek thing, that is really weird that she was like possibly so upset that she filed this report and then went on to marry the guy. And it also made me think, I don't know, Del, maybe you know which police department this was, but over like the past six months to a year, there was another police department in the U.S. that had like a sex scandal because people, officers were like going around like sleeping with each other and having like sex parties at one officer's like lake house and there was like all this drama and like nude photos exchanged and people like hooking up in police cars and it kind of made me think of that too oh my gosh you might be thinking about the tennessee police department are you thinking about the one where there was like uh, a female police officer and she was with like at least five of her co-workers yes. or something like that <laughs> yes that's them <laughs> Yes. For anyone interested, go look that up too, because that's kind of, I guess, a lighter side of the police corruption and fuckery that we talk about. Definitely. Yes. Megan Hall was the female officer involved in that. And that's still being investigated. So we might find out more over what that department was doing and the type of activities that they were engaging with on and off the clock, by the way. Yes. Very messy. Definitely. That wraps up this week's case. Thank you for listening. Let us know in the comments what you think about the murder of Ronald Williams. You can read more about this case and how to support us in the links below. We will be back next week with a brand new episode focused on the great adventure Haunted Castle. As always, stay safe.